welcome a longtime friend and comrade in the work, Pastor Delante Golston. Amen. Is here in the building and he is going to be our guest preacher. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a bio on him. He is uh, happily married to Claire, uh, his wife. I believe they met at Fuller. Did y'all meet at Fuller? Praise God. Fuller Theological Seminary. And uh, he was born and raised in Washington, D.C. Uh, he is an educated brother, went to Swarthmore College, Georgetown University, and Fuller Theological Seminary. Amen. He has been uh, raised in the National Baptist Church as a teacher, preacher, and a musician. Uh, he planted churches in both uh, Los Angeles and now currently in Washington, D.C. Uh, he has been uh, the anchor and the founder of our Live Free partner in Washington, D.C. It's called uh, the D.C. Peace Walks, and they lead uh, clergy walks and advocate to the for the end of gun violence and police violence in the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C. He's a wonderful brother. He's actually on his sabbatical, and uh, he's on his way up the coast to Portland and Seattle. And I said, well, you know, Pastor Delante, there's a highway that runs right on your way. Somebody say amen. <laughs> And uh, he said, well, let me pray about it, Pastor Mike. And then he called me back the next day and said, I got a word from the Lord. I said, touch your neighbor. <laughs> Amen. I'm glad you got a word from the Lord on your sabbatical on the way up the coast. Amen. But I am super grateful and glad to have my friend and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful comrade in the work of both faith and justice here with us. I invite you to stand to your feet as we always do. Let's prepare to welcome and greet the spokesperson for the King of Glory today, Pastor Delante Golston. Oh, praise the Lord. Uh, it is such an honor uh, to be here. You can be seated um, in the presence of God. Um, it is such an honor to be here. I have to tell you just how much uh, I love your pastor. I, I tell you, um, you ever been in a place where you've wanted to know if what you've been praying for is possible? And then God sends angels along the way to encourage you on that path. That's, that's, who, you, that's who you are. That's not who you've been. I call this man my bishop uh, because I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> That's not no title he's seeking, but I, I jokingly refer to him as bishop. But but I mean it from my heart because I look to you, brother, to 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 follow Christ as you do, and have for many years. If you don't mind, um, if you if you love your pastor, would you mind uh, on this 19 year anniversary month just just showing some love for the man of God, the angel of this house here at the way? It's good to give thanks. The Bible says, this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us in everything we give thanks. Glory to God in the highest. Praise God. Uh, and while I, I'm here and, and have the mic, I have to, I have to also acknowledge uh, my brother Ben, uh, who in his absence is also a true brother in ministry uh, to me. And I, I'm on that journey of belonging that he talks and preaches so much about. Uh, because I'm Baptist uh, in my pedigree, I have to acknowledge certainly uh, my pastor, Reverend Dr. Bobby Hicks, uh, who baptized me, uh, trained me, uh, and um, I just wouldn't be here without him. Uh, and so he also installed me as the pastor at Peace Fellowship Church. I have to thank my mother in ministry, uh, Reverend Dr. Alethea Smith Withers. She is the one who encouraged me to go to seminary, uh, and then I'm going to thank uh, Kevin Ha, Pastor Kevin Ha at New, at New City Church in L.A., who was the person who encouraged me on my internship when I was in seminary. Everybody has a role to play. Are you hearing me? Uh, it's important to give honor and reverence. And while I'm giving honor and reverence, I got to thank my wife in her absence, my beautiful bride, my friend, um, who I'm, I'm missing right now. Uh, Claire, Elizabeth, Wiggins, Golston, and our two beautiful daughters, Evan, who's six, um, and Olive, who's three. Uh, it's a privilege to be able to raise and see God's kindness on the face of your children. 
and I'm thankful to God um, for that. Uh, I, I saw my friend and brother, Reverend Dr. Bryson White, in the back, who is a professor at uh, Santa Clara University. He brought my friend, Kairos White, with him, who's four years old. Uh, I, I want to thank him and his wife, beautiful wife, Jennifer, for their hospitality to me. They gave me, they gave the preacher a place to stay, amen, when I came into the bay. If you're wondering how, where I stayed uh, as I traveled up the road. Uh, and, and Kairos, uh, yesterday, he was looking for his friend. Uh, and he was talking about me. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And I just, I, I don't know, I was in kids ministry for many years when I was at, in, in the course of my, my journey. And I know this, that whenever a child embraces you as a friend, somewhere I read that, that we ought to suffer the, not, not the children and, 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 and forbid them not. Somewhere I, I read that unless we enter uh, the kingdom of God as a child, uh, that we can't even know the kingdom. So I want to say thank you, Kai Rose. Thank you, Kai, for being a friend to me. And thank you for, for staying and, and, to, and to hear me preach. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Uh, those of you who don't know, I heard the call to preach when I was six years old. My pastor, who I gave reverence to, put me on, in the pulpit, had me stand up, step up steps. At the, in those days, he had to pull the microphone down. I had to, you know, those wiry, I had to pull it down just so I could, oh, glory to God, say what, the, what thus saith the Lord. And I felt a fire within me in, in, in those early days. And so it's for all these reasons that I give God thanks. But there is indeed a word uh, from God for the people of God. Dr. Laberton, it is so good to see you here, sir, um, as has already been stated. It's found in Mark's gospel in the fifth chapter. Uh, I'm going to read a chunk of text, so I want you to hang with me if you can. Uh, I'm going to read from verses 1 through 20. Is it your tradition to stand for the reading of God's word? If it is, those who are able to stand, if you would stand with me. Uh, if it is not your tradition, you can be as you are. I was just, uh, as Pastor Mike referred, I was just up in the mountains of Big Sur with some Benedictine monks, and I was amazed that even 90-year-old monks, every time they read from the gospel, they stood. I'm struck by that today. Uh, let's read together as we look at uh, the New Revised Standard Version of God's Holy Word, reading again from Mark's Gospel, chapter 5. It reads, they came together to the other side. Somebody say, say other side of the sea to the region of the Gerasenes. And when he had stepped out of the boat, immediately a man from the tombs with an unclean spirit met him. He lived among the tombs and no one could restrain him anymore, even with a chain, for he had often been restrained with shackles and chains. But the chains he wrenched apart, the shackles he broke in pieces, and no one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always howling and bruising himself. One version says, cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and bowed down before him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God not to torment me. For he said to him, come out of the man, Jesus said, you unclean spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? He replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. He begged him earnestly not to send him out of the region. Now there on the hillside, a great herd of swine was feeding, and the unclean spirits begged him, send us into the swine. Let us into them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the swine, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, stampeded down the steep bank into the sea and were drowned in the sea. The swine herds ran off and told it in the city and in the country the people who came to see what it was that had happened, they, they came to see Jesus and saw the man possessed by demons sitting there clothed and in his right mind. 
the very man who had had the legion, and they became frightened, those who had seen what had happened by the man possessed by demons, and they came to the swine to re report it. Then they began to beg Jesus to leave their neighborhood. They got scared, y'all. And he was getting into the boat. The man who had been possessed by demons begged him that he might be with him. But Jesus refused and said to him, go home. Somebody shout, go home. To your own people. And tell them how much the Lord has done for you. And what mercy. Glory to God. He has shown you. And he went away and began to proclaim to the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Glory be to God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of God's word. It's already blessed. But for the next few moments that we have together, I promise not to keep you too long. I just want to speak as the Lord might lead. Uh, I had another message in, my, in mind, and the Lord stirred me in my sleep last night and, and asked me to change the message. I had prepared a whole message of encouragement for you, brother. I, I was ready. <laughs> but the Lord had another agenda. And for the next few, few moments, I want to speak as the Lord might lead on the subject or thought, Lord... Have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Gracious God, I won't have power to preach unless you give it to me. I won't have power to speak unless you use my voice. I pray, gracious God, word of life, bread of heaven that you would feed your holy people, that we might want no more. Now, Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable, O oh God, in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are our strength. You are our redeemer. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give you thanks. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Lord. Well, and unless uh, it's already been stated, but unless you stepped out for a moment or have been hiding under a rock somewhere or perhaps, uh, as I was, was up in the hills of Big Sur without Internet or cell phone reception in the last 24 to 48 hours, uh, then you have indeed heard that yesterday uh, at a political rally in Butler, Pennsylvania, that uh, former President Donald J. Trump was indeed shot in his upper ear by a would-be assassin, one 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks. Somehow we always hear the first, middle, and last name of the men, usually white men, who find themselves in this position. Uh, and he is from Bethel City, Pennsylvania. Crooks tragically also was killed by the Secret Service. Uh, there is one rally attendee to, at this point who is dead and two others who are critically injured. As has been stated, we are indeed praying for the family of those who uh, were injured, praying for the families of those who were slain, indeed praying for President Joe Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris and for all leaders who attempt to lead in the wake of what is the first attempted assassination on a current or former president in 43 years since the attempted assassination of Ronald Reagan in 1981. And as, as we pray, as we survey the state of this country and this world, uh, as we pray, as we assess the wreckage of the seeds of death and violence and cruelty that we have been sown in this country, as we pray and survey the condition of this place where we live, 
it should be crystal clear to you, uh, my brothers and my sisters, uh, and it is crystal clear to me that what we are watching before our very eyes is nothing less than a demonic stronghold on our nation. And uh, beloved, if there is indeed a future of any kind for those of us who live here, who go to work every day here, who attempt to raise our families here, if there is indeed any way forward that can be characterized by peace, then we ought to pray, uh, Lord, uh, that, 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 that the Lord our God would have mercy. If there is any prayer that the Spirit is inviting us into this morning, uh, it, it is a prayer that I can so clearly hear my grandma Earlene uh, Bennington pray when, uh, from St. Stephen, South Carolina. It is a prayer that I heard my grandfather, Deacon Joseph Bennington, we called him Josie, say. Uh, it is a prayer that I have heard my grandmother Eliza Jane Golston pray. It is a prayer that I heard my daddy, Deacon Donald Golston, pray uh, when he didn't know what else to do with his boy. It's a prayer that I've heard my mother pray when she was trying to teach me to drive. First time I heard my mama cuss, Deacon Dorothy Ghost, Lord have mercy. And, and, and that prayer that, sh that, that, that she prayed, that her husband prayed, that my grandparents prayed, that somebody in here I know has prayed today is simply, Lord, have mercy. When you are searching in your heart to find compassion for a man who, since he walked down that escalator in 2016, has only used words, only used his power, only used his privilege, and even ultimately used in the highest office in the land to sow seeds and stoke hatred and Fear and bile and wickedness and disease type of spirits and, 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 and racism and misogyny and, Lord have mercy, immigrant hostility. And try to do it all holding the Bible rightly upside down. Lord have mercy, holding the, holding the name and daring to speak the name of our Christ and Lord Jesus. All we can pray is, Lord, have mercy. Well, you can clearly see that this entire political establishment in this country in the Democratic Party is completely and utterly invested, as the Sister, doc, sister Dr. Moni mentioned earlier, and Brother Devante, amen, almost my namesake, hey, praise the Lord, uh, brought us together on earlier. This is a country and a party and leaders who continue to send billions of dollars with a B, to support the annihilation of an entire group of people just to somehow, by some sort of twisted moral math, we kill nearly 40,000 people to somehow compensate for the tragic, indeed tragic and horrendous slaughter of 1,200? All we can say is, Lord, have mercy. And when you know that gun violence is now the leading cause of death for black men from the age of 18 to 35, and the CDC has already declared that it's a public health crisis, but we got leaders in cities like mine who can find half a billion dollars to fund more police, more incarceration, more surveillance, touting new drones that they just bought, but we can't even find a, a, a million dollars to fund prevention? Somebody shout, Lord, have mercy. When you see that on every single index of health, maternal health, breast cancer, uterine health, with fibroids in our community, lung cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, mental health, Lord, asthma, domestic violence, our community is still off the charts, number one on list that we prefer not to be on. All we can shout is, Lord, have mercy. We are a people 
who live in a nation that reeks of death. We are a people who live in a nation that is invested in death. We are a people who live in a nation that reeks from the stench of death. Until Jesus comes to meet us. See, it is in the Gospel of Mark, Lord have mercy, Dr. Labrador is here, so I got to do my proper research. Uh, it is in the Gospel of, of Mark, uh, Bible scholars, that we find Jesus who is now interested in crossing to the other side. Somebody shout the other side. Come on, touch your neighbor and say the other side. Jesus is now interested in crossing over to the other side of the sea. See, unlike uh, Matthew's audience, uh, which is primarily Jewish, Mark's audience is primarily comprised of Gentile converts to the way. Uh, that, that's folks that, according to Torah, were unclean. That's folks that, that you wouldn't want to sit next to in church. That's folks that, that don't live in the zip code that you prefer. Are you hearing me? That's folks whose sexuality or their identity might not agree with your own. Are you hearing me? That's folks who might not eat the way you eat, talk the way you eat, dress the way you do. Uh, we just talking about Gentiles. And, and, and so unlike Matthew's gospel, Matthew presents, Matthew actually in many ways presents what, what, what today we might call a Jewish first uh, uh, gospel. Uh, 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 Matthew uh, might uh, 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 present a, 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 a make uh, Israel great again uh, type gospel. Uh, because as soon as you open up Matthew's gospel, Matthew chapter 1 gives you this brilliant genealogy. And, and Matthew starts, of course, with uh, King David. He wants you to know, he wants his Jewish audience, say with me, to know that, 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 that he wants his hearers to understand that the people of God under the reign of David experienced their greatness. And so from Matthew's point of view, from Matthew's worldview, he's trying to get Jewish people to see that their greatness can be possible again. And so Matthew is careful to draw in the lineage of Jesus, not only Davidic lineage, but also identify Jesus as the son of Abraham. Are you hearing me? But Mark is different. Mark has a different understanding because he's preaching to different people. He wants them to be able to hear the message of the word of life. And so it's in Mark's gospel as opposed to Matthew's gospel that we meet for the first time the Syrophoenician woman. Yeah. Oh, you don't know about that sister. This is the sister. She's a Gentile and she changes the mind of God. Oh, I'm going to mess with your theology today. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I'm glad to know that every now and then that my God can change God's mind. See, before Jesus met this woman, he believed that he was only sent, the Bible says, to the lost tribe of Judah. He was only sent to people that looked like him, spoke like him, dressed like him. Oh, but Mark starts Mark's gospel not in a genealogy, but Mark starts his gospel in the wilderness. <laughs> Mark starts his gospel in the hood, y'all. Mark starts his gospel in Appalachia, y'all. Mark starts his gospel. Gospel somewhere around 87th Street, y'all. Hey, can you hear me in here today? Mark starts his gospel on the other side of the 580. Do you hear me in here today? Because Mark wants us to understand that there is a God who, when you hear the voice of the oppressed, that when this God hears the voice of women, that when this God hears the voice of the marginalized, God said, Oop, I had forgot about you. I need to make sure I see about all of my people. This is the woman that Jesus called a dog. Do you hear me in here today? But Jesus changed his mind. 
And for somebody, that's a word right there. Somebody has already written yourself out of God's story. Somebody has already come to God believing that you don't have love in your heart for me because of who I am, because of what I've been through, because my resume don't look like her resume, because my, my bio don't sound like this dude bio to stand up on this stage today. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know the struggles that I've had to face. You don't know that at many times in my life I have written myself out, written myself off of God's story, but I'm so glad that the God we serve changed his mind about me. Said, I still love you. I still care for you. I still have a purpose and a plan for your life. Anybody glad to hear that God changed God's mind? This is where we find Jesus yet crossing over. To the other side. Somebody shout other side. Jesus is crossing over the lake because Mark wants us to understand that on that side of the lake is where the Gentiles live. On that side of the lake is where folk who are outside of what they thought was the reach of God in, in fact dwell. Oh, glory to God. And this is where we find ourselves today. We find ourselves in a story, so many of us, where you have taken up residence in a narrative and in a story where you believe that you are somehow outside of the reach of the grace, of the mercy, and of the love of God. And because you have decided to take up residence there, it has you in bondage. It has caused you to change your actual place of residence. For when God made humanity, when God made Adam, which my Hebrew professor told me, Adam, Adam, the name just means humanity. It's not talking about gender. Do you hear me here today? It's simply, I'm going to help, I hope I help somebody here today. But when we hear the word Adam, it means humanity. Are you hearing me today? And when God makes Adam, when God makes Adam, the first thing that God says isn't that Adam is toe up from the flow up. The first thing that, that, that God says about Adam is, oh, I, I wish I could have done a little bit better on that. The first thing that God says about Adam is not, oh, I, mm, I think I need to re reshape that surface right there. No, the first thing that God says about Adam is that Adam is very good. Yet somehow, because of the systems of this world that deceive us about the truth that God has for us, we find ourselves believing the lie that we don't deserve life. But somehow we begin to believe that we in fact are deserving of death. I, I'm here to talk to somebody who's still living in a curse. Even after Adam and Eve committed a, a terrible uh, uh, mistake, I believe they were like my daughters. You know, I, don't, I don't actually, when I look at Adam and Eve, I, I look at them as, as I look at my children. They were learning and they were testing their boundaries. I have a lot of grace for Adam and Eve. I know that maybe that's not the tradition where you came from. I know that maybe you have been taught to believe that, that Adam and Eve were, were somehow destined to fall and they are forever uh, broken and fallen because of what they did. But I want to I want, I help somebody today who is still le living in the language of the curse that was pronounced against them. Lord, have mercy. Somebody is still hearing God say to you that you aren't worthy. Somebody is still hearing the voice of God. God say that because of your background, that because of the body you were born in, that because of the ancestry that you share, that you are somehow broken, that you are somehow fallen, that you are somehow a descendant of Ham and therefore a descendant of something that is nasty or dirty. Somebody is hearing the voice of God say that because you were born with a different sexual identity or orientation, yes, I'm going right 
heart here that somehow you are not deserving of the love and grace and mercy of our God. Somebody is here and they're because I don't even have a GED. I'm around these folks with MATs and, and PhDs and, 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 and I don't know what else kind of these. Lord have mercy that I am not worthy of God's love but God is still saying to you that you are very good. Hear what Adam says in the wake of the curses in, in, in Genesis uh, chapter 3. The first thing Adam says uh, when he th comes to his senses, I believe, and he remembers that God gave him the authority to name things. God gave Adam the authority, said, if there's a duck-billed platypus, I want you to call it a duck Bill Platypus, I'm a birdie, y'all. When I turned 40, I, I started paying attention to things I had never paid attention to before. You hear me? I started seeing cardinals. I started seeing blue jays. Hey, mercy. Uh, 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 yesterday, driving uh, through the bay, I seen some great egrets. Do you hear me out here today? I'm going I'm to I'm I'm flex right now. Every now and then, I see some great blue herons. Are you hearing me today? And, and I believe that God first gave humanity the power to name. And hear what Adam, what Adam, what humanity has to say about his wife in the face of a curse that even God spoke. First thing Adam says is that I'm going to name my wife Eve, which means the mother of life. That's a, a word for somebody in here today. That in the face of even the things that they put in God's mouth to describe you. Even in the face or the wake of the ways in which people try to use God's name to break you or shame you. Remember the authority that God gave you. Not the authority to dominate or to subdue but to name. So speak life in your situation. Speak life in your marriage today. Speak life over your children. Speak life over your organizing work. I speak life in the name of the Lord Jesus over the weight church and everything connected to it. In the name of Jesus. And it's when, it's when we forget it's when we forget our divine authority to speak life that we find ourselves trapped in systems of death. It's when we forget that a man can't stand on a stage before thousands for years and use his tongue to speak death and not somehow understand, not expect, not justify, but understand that if you speak death, if you sow the seeds of death and destruction, so it is when we forget God's ordained purpose for our lives to to truly thrive, to, to truly be free before God and before one another, that we find ourselves not just breaking out of systems to get back in them again and, and get it. I spoke to my cousin yesterday. Lord, help me today. While I was with my bishop, we trying to get a, uh, he told me it was the best burger in, 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 in Oakland. I had it yesterday over there at Barney's, praise the Lord. It did remind, it reminded me of my mama's burger. I ain't gonna lie. They wasn't playing, they wasn't playing. They, they did not hold back, praise the Lord. And I, I appreciate Barney's. It was a blessing to my soul. They need to put a little bit more seasoning in that burger. But it was a blessing, amen, to my soul. And while, while we were sitting there waiting, we was gonna go one place and they ended up going another place, my cousin called me. I had been missing calls from him all morning. My man B, he was with me, Bryson was with me. And, and, and I haven't talked to my cousin Terrell in about 15 years because he's always in and out and out and in. I got a nephew. I'm praying for him right now. 
I thank God that God seems to have really gotten a hold of my nephew. We've been able to wrap our arms around him and, and really show him some love. And, and amen, he found himself a good, a good thing. He found himself a good, a, good, a, good, a good lady, a good boo, amen. And I'm about to be a great uncle. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, and, 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 and I see that, 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 that there's, a, there's a corner turning in his life. But my, but my cousin, you know, I'm really worried about him. You know, he's, he's coming home. I pray that he might see this message to know, Terrell, I love you, man. I believe God has a purpose for your life. But I know that I'm not the only person that, that, that has a relative. I have, I have a brother that was a car. I, I know I'm not the only. I'm, I'm supposed to be the good, you know, so-called whatever, good kid out my family, whatever, the, whatever you want to call that, right? But I'm not, I know I'm not the only person that knows what it is to, to have somebody that you love. To be in bondage and out of bondage, and out of bondage and in bondage. I, I, I you know, I, you know, I, I've lived with, with 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 anxiety and depression for the last 25 years of my life. I didn't know how to name it exactly, but I know what it is to not be able to get out of bed in the morning. Do you hear me in here today? I know what it is to be so 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 stuck, like. Feeling like you in molasses. I didn't. I didn't. I, because we don't have language uh, for all these things. It took. It's taken me, and I'm still meeting with my therapist. I, I will probably be meeting with my therapist. It's one of the reasons why I got into running because I. I love the feeling of what they call runner's high. It helps to stabilize me. It helps to get me out. Are you hearing me of the clouds? It helps me to get reconnected to my body and to creation. Are you hearing me? And, 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 what, and what Jesus is asking for all of us to do is to not forget that sometimes we get stuck in cycles and spirals of death. Sometimes we smell like the stench of death. I remember when my father had a hard time coming into my room at a particular point in my 20s. I was struggling, y'all. And for the first time, I saw that he, I, this man never told me yet that he loves me. I know he loves me. There's certain things that, you, you know, you look for your whole life and you don't necessarily get them. Are you hearing me today? Can I be honest and vulnerable in here today? But I saw for the first time in my life that this man truly cares for me. Because I had a stench. Are you hearing me? I don't want to talk back to me in here. I was so stuck. I was so lost in my own head. Are you hearing me today? That I needed somebody who was willing to come to the other side to find me. Are you hearing me? And, and, and that's what I believe that Jesus is, is calling us into. Sometimes we can find ourselves taking up residence around the tombs. It's, it's kind of like uh, when the power goes out. You know, the first time the power goes out, uh, uh, everything feels so dark you can't see, right? Uh, y'all never been in a situation where the power goes out, apparently. Y'all ain't never had, y'all ain't never missed y'all. Okay, I'm talking to the folk over here who have actually missed in D.C. It's a Pepco bill. Hey, man, I'm talking to the folk who, is it the Edison, Edison out here? I don't know what it is. P there it is. Who missed that PG&E bill. And every now and then, I, I've known what it is. Oh, y'all don't hear me in here today to have to adjust my light, my, my seeing to the dark. Initially, when the lights first go out, you're like, oh, man, it's dark in this junk. Lights went out. Oh, you know, I, oh, man, oh, oh yeah, that's, that's what it was. I, you know, then it all comes to you what happened, right? But over time, what happens is you begin to adjust your vision to the dark. And what first was an environment in which you could not see becomes an environment that becomes normalized to you. And God is coming today in the person, in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, crossing over into your normalized darkness to say that I love you and I care for you. I care so much about you that I can't count my equality with God, Philippians says in the, in the second chapter, as something that ought to be taken advantage of. But the Bible says that Jesus 
emptied himself, taking the form of a servant because he cares for you. I wish there was one person who knows that God cares. I wish there was one person who don't need a, a preacher from D.C. to come and tell you that he cares because you already know that she cares for you. And this is what the empire tries to do to us. It tries to normalize our darkness. It tries to create patterns in which we adjust to inequity. We adjust to oppression. We adjust in relationships that in which we know don't affirm our worth and our value. We adjust in systems that we know no longer serves us. But when Jesus comes, when the master comes, when the one who says, don't even call me master, don't even worry about them titles. What I want you to do is call me friend. When your friend comes, when the lily of the valley comes, when the bright in the morning star comes, when the rose of Sharon comes, the Bible says that he came to set the captive free to declare the year of the Lord's favor. And I want you to see what Jesus does here. Jesus goes, and somebody asked yourself the question, why did Jesus drive the, the spirits into the swine? Come here one more time, Bible scholars, and I promise you, I'm out your way. He comes into, drives the spirits into the swine. And that ain't just because we are not eating a little bit of pig every now and then. Now, Jesus ain't coming to mess with your bacon. Do you hear me here? today. Jesus ain't come to mess with your poke chop. Y'all ain't talking back to me. But the Bible says that he drove the unclean spirits from the swine into the swine. Ah, let me help you real quick and then I'm out, I'm, I'm out the way. What you need to remember, students of, of God, what you need to remember, child of God, is that the boar head is a symbol of the Roman Empire. Oh, go ahead down aisle three at the Safeway, and next time you see that boy's head, you're going to remember this message, bless God, today. That indeed the very image mounted upon byways and highways throughout the Greco-Roman Empire is indeed the head of a pig. And when the spirit that is at work in this man names itself, it identifies itself with legion. Which, let me help you again, beloved. Legion is indeed the force of military, police, systemic, and economic exploitation in their day. I wish I had one person who knows that it was the pigs that enforced over taxation to the people of God. I wish there was one person who understood that it was indeed the pigs who tortured and crucified my Savior and your Savior. My Lord and your Lord. It was indeed the spirit of the pigs. My God today. But when Jesus comes, he drives that spirit from the pig to the pigs. My God. And when they reach the pigs, the spirit does what that spirit always does. It drives even the pigs to their own damnation and destruction. So the good news for us, beloved, the good news for you, beloved, and I know it's good news for me, is that after this former demoniac was healed, after this former demoniac was delivered, after this ex-addict was healed, are you hearing me? After this ex-domestic abuser was set free, after this ex-power abuser on the job was healed. Are you hearing me today? 
after this former help us God pedophile even was healed Lord have mercy after this bank robber have mercy God was delivered after um, after 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 this drug addict was indeed set free now, Jesus did not let this man go with him now, but Jesus told the man to go home. Some of us have been lost in our work and purpose in life because we have been discipled by people who teach us to reject the blessing of home. We have Many of us have been discipled by people who want to go all the way, Lord have mercy, to the hinterland. I ain't going to name no country. Take pictures, Lord have mercy, and talk about how God has sent them there. But have neglected the duties and responsibilities and the blessing at home. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 19, you, to the Pharisees, I ain't mean, talking about y'all, he's just talking about other, other church folk, amen. I'll turn this way. He says, you have gone as far as land and sea to make a single convert, but have made them twice the son of hell that you are. If you've ever wondered how people can use the name of Jesus, if you've ever wondered how people can use the Bible, the demons don't have a problem with profession. You read the story I just heard. You heard the story I just read. When Jesus came, the demon said, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me by God. Don't torment me. Some of us out here using the name of Jesus at home. Some of us out here trying to use the name of Jesus in your work. But have you been following the ways of Jesus? Have you been soaking in the spirit of Jesus? It ain't enough. We up here trying to make folk do pretty prayers and up here trying to make folks say stuff with their mouth. And I believe in the confession. I believe we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that the Lord Christ was raised from the dead. And if your profession don't line up with your discipleship, then you ain't walking in the ways of Christ. Even a demon can use the name Jesus. Even a demon can pray. Are you hearing me? But when God gets a hold of that spirit, when the Lord, the Messiah, gets a hold of that spirit, he tells that spirit, go home my father deacon donald goldston uh, uh, he often says to me we are now one of three black families left on our block in chocolate city in dc and when my dad started to see his neighbors leave our city he would often say to me as a child Boy, you can't run away from yourself. So many of us in, I believe with a good heart, and I believe with a sincere desire to keep our families safe or secure or because we've endured so much trauma. Lord, I'm, I know I'm tired. Or the vigils or the funerals. Help me, Jesus. On top, and this is just... It's just in my neighborhood where I live. I ain't, I ain't talking about what they did in Pennsylvania. I'm talking about the shooting. We got to deal with it every single day. Babies, kids, little babies, toddlers. It's too much. And I do understand. I, I used to really judge folk, Mike, so pray for my heart, you know. But, but I understand. But the invitation that I want you to hear Today in the message, as I, as I close, I know I'm real Baptist and closed five times. Help me today. <laughs> it's my last close, I promise. <laughs> Glory to God. The invitation. <laughs> you, 
the invitation that I, I hear the Spirit of God calling us to go home. Do you really think that a figure like a Donald Trump could have arisen in this country if people had actually followed the wise wisdom of that prophetic voice of Ella Jo Baker in the Freedom Rise of the 1960s when she called young white organizers and young black organizers together and they worked in solidarity with each other all across the South, all across the lands where my grandparents are from, where my mother picked cotton, my father picked cotton in South Carolina and Georgia. Do you, do you think that a, a figure like Trump would have arisen had we just simply followed her wise and winsome words? Those words were, go home and continue the work of liberation that we have begun. In my organizing work in West Virginia, I've had the privilege of meeting some of those initial students of Ella Jo Baker. I met uh, a 77 year old uh, older white man who says, I've, I've been right here in Williamstown, West Virginia for the last 50 years because Ella Jo Baker told us to go back home He's been organizing former coal miners and doing anti-racism work in places like that for the last 50 years. Can you imagine the fruit of if believers in the way who happen to be white and if believers of the way who happen to be black or indigenous or queer or Asian or whatever the case may be, if we spent as much time crossing over the sea as we did taking care of home. And when he got there, the Bible says that he told everybody there of the mercy that God had bestowed upon him and everyone was amazed. I believe that the future that God is painting for us is one that is indeed full of mercy. Mercy is not about what we've done, but as Brian Stevenson always reminds us, it's about not being defined by the worst thing we've ever done. And beloved, as I look back over my life, and as I invite you to look back over yours, I invite you to see the signs of God's mercy and enable the Spirit of God to free you, free from the shame of, of, of what you've done in the past or what has been done to you, and find your way home, that you might be the answer to that prayer. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God bless you. Yeah.